will probably be a bit long, but as I've said, it's important that we finish all this before we move further. So you must have discussed why laparoscopic surgery, why MIS. Uh, there are very obvious causes here. We have less post-op pain, cosmesis, which should be mentioned last though, short stay in the hospital, faster return to normality, a better view and access. Uh, you can't compare an open surgery with laparoscopy where you can have a magnified and a closer view to the pathology. Faster return to bowel function, less wound infection and dehiscence, less tissue trauma during dissection, less adhesions, obviously less blood loss, although you will see it magnified, but it will be less if you follow the principles. Magnification with better definition and Remember, these are surgeries that can be recorded for review to see how you're doing or how the surgery was done and for training purposes. A few principles I believe that are very important to mention. Number one, we have to know that laparoscopy would mean we work with within a cavity, which in this case is the abdominal cavity or the uterine cavity in hysteroscopy, uh, but you have to create this cavity because the normal uh, cavity of the abdomen is actually a vacuum, it's negative pressure. So you have to distend this cavity with a pneumoperitoneum. So that is a principle you have to remember and we'll have to therefore know very well how to do this and safely. The next one is you're going to visualize this on a screen. So it's not direct vision, it's, it's, it's visualized on the screen and operate. So your motor axis and your visual access will have to be trained to do surgery in that way. So that is something we have to keep in mind. We have to keep in mind that surgery in MIS is always under video control and permanent watch. When you're doing your own surgery in an open case, there's adhesions, you'll put your hand and you'll separate it and be like, okay, done. We can't do that anymore in, in laparoscopic surgery. Everybody in the theater is watching you. Everybody who is recording is, is, is going to watch you on exactly what you're doing. So you have to remember that now I'm under watch. So do things the right way. Uh, there are no shortcuts in MIS. You need technical equipment knowledge. So it's not, laparoscopy is not only learning how to do the surgery. It's also learning the technology around the surgery. So uh, in regards to anesthesia, what are the effects that we're gonna get because of whatever we're gonna ask for in trendling back position? What are the changes we're gonna get? Uh, how do we work with energy? How do we work with, uh, with uh, the, the video and the, the insufflation, etc. So you need to know this technology. Please don't rely on somebody doing it for you. Uh, I, I, I am very uh, against partial knowledge of different areas. Technology-wise, you need to know, as the captain of the ship, you need to know everything about that technology. In laparoscopy, remember, it's always teamwork. You, you can't work alone. I, it doesn't matter how good a surgeon you are. If your anesthesia team is not supportive, you will struggle. If your nursing team is not supportive and does not know about the instruments, you will struggle. So you need a team. If your assistant and camera person does not able, is not able to give you good view, you will struggle. So it doesn't, it's not a I situation. It's always a teamwork situation. So please remember that. Ergonomics, laparoscopy and MIS is, is gonna have a very short ceiling for, for ergonomics. What does that mean? We'll discuss and briefly go through ergonomics, but uh, what it means is it's very easy to injure yourself. We always think patient, 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 yes, but in MIS, we'll also have to think us, because if you don't, you'll injure your shoulder, you'll injure your wrist, you'll injure your neck, because of constant bad positioning of your head to the screen. So please, you need to know ergonomics. Uh, I learned, learned laparoscopy now, I've been doing it for 25 years, but I learned it when this was probably not a very important topic. And therefore I have injured my shoulder. I was yesterday morning, uh, Sunday, yes, yesterday morning in the physiotherapy department having my shoulder again 
uh, having some ultrasonic uh, treatment. So this is a, sh I've, I am not injured now. This is injured years ago, but it still disturbs me once in a while. So please remember, you need to know ergonomics and how to prevent therefore these injuries. You'll need to learn depth. You'll need to learn 2D because most places, we have 3D laparoscopy in this place, uh, but in most places you will be working with 2D laparoscopy. So how to convert this 3D view that you are used to when you're doing open surgery into a 2D screen view where you can't see depth that clearly, where you don't know which structure is behind which in a proper way, it's all laid out on one screen, you'll have to practice and learn that. Uh, then limited tactile feedback. I tell people when we are training that if this thing was put on the table and I am supposed to close my eyes and I just feel it this way, I don't need to be told what this is. I will still understand. Now, the same thing with the laparoscopic instrument. If I am, Joy, laparoscopic instrument. So if I am taking an instrument and I'm going to be doing this, all right, I, I don't care how experienced I am. I may not be able to tell you exact consistency, how firm it is, how, what is the exact shape in there, especially if it's a fibroid inside in the myo myometrium. Unless you have pre-planned and mapped it, you may not know where it is. So in, in an open surgery, you'll, you'll palpate the uterus and say, ah, I feel something here. Make a cut and remove it. You need to plan differently for MIS. So these few things should be important. Fulcrum effect. When I'm doing an open surgery, if I want to move this from here to here, I have to move it like that, okay? The same direction. In laparoscopy, I have a fulcrum at, at, at the abdomen cavity. So this is on the abdomen. So if I want to move it up, my hand cannot, because you'll, you'll realize that's something you might start doing. Everybody initially does that. I, I tell my assistant, move the uterus up and the hand goes up immediately because that's what they want to do. Uh, but actually, it has to go down to move the uterus up. You understand what I'm saying? So you'll have to train yourself that, listen, this is a fulcrum. I, I'm not supposed to move in the direction that I want to move in the screen. I'll probably move opposite to get that movement. You, you understanding what I'm saying? Then magnification. You'll see even small, small capillaries sometimes when you're dissecting in very f extreme cases like in endometriosis where you're going very fine, you'll see up to capillaries. So, and when you cut that, you'll have a little bleed, but that's going to be like a very small streak, but on a screen, it might look a bit obvious. So you have to learn that, listen, not every single RBC in there that you see should be worried about, but, but once you know, initially it will look like, oh, there's a bleeder, there's a bleeder. So ideally speaking, you remember it's about that. Finally, surgery in MIS is uh, vision dependent. So what does it mean? Uh, if I can't see, I can't operate. So if my camera person does not show me properly, I can't operate. If I have a blood dot, a blood spot on my camera scope, I can't operate. If I have a bleeder that is constantly pumping and I, and it, I, I can't show you properly, I can't operate. Are you getting my point? So we have to be alert and make sure my vision is constantly clear. In an open surgery, it's different. You have a big a vessel there, you just go and put your hand there and then you'll be looking for whatever you want. Okay, get me a mop, get me. You won't have that type of time. If you think that you have a bleeder and you're just gonna suck out and then think you're gonna hold it, my friend, by the time you'll hold it, that person would have bled half a liter. So you have to be more alert. If you can't see properly, you can't operate. So learn that. Now we move quickly to the OT setup. Uh, I mean, that's a standard setup. We'll show you in our theaters as well. Uh, so you have the patient with the trolley, you have the anesthetist at the head end. In gynae, we normally have the patients in a, in a, in a, a Trendelenburg or a, uh, I mean, in, in a Trendelenburg position, but we actually put them on stirrups and therefore we would want to see if we can obviously have an assistant between the legs as well. We have ideally two monitors, one 
facing the, the surgeon, one facing the anest I mean the assistant. Uh, if you have one only, then try and bring it between the legs so that don't, don't leave it on the side of the surgeon because I am the surgeon so I should see. What about this other person? What will they have to do? You, you get what I'm saying? You do this for 15 minutes and your neck is gone. And trust me, you'll forever curse that surgeon for giving you an, a neck issue. So try and be considerate. Have that one screen put in the middle so both of you are seeing at an angle. But ideal situation is one there, one here, and if possible, one for the second assistant who is between the legs. Okay? So, so that is ideal. We do have uh, that kind of a setup uh, in this theater. Next, I told you about equipment. We can't work without knowledge of equipment and technology. Equipment normally you should have discussed is vision equipment, covering the monitor, the camera, the processor, the telescope, the light source, the light cable, etc. Then we have access equipment where you have the insufflator, the trocar cannula system, the varies if need be, the CO2 gas and uh, uh, the, the cylinders itself, and the smoke evacuator if possible. We have energy equipment, which is the electrosurgical unit and its related instruments and cables. We have suction irrigation, etc., and others. When we go to instruments, we have instruments of access. That includes the troca cannula, varies, and the closure ones, the port closure. Then we have energy, where you would have either bipolar, monopolar, or advanced energy and ultrasonic energy. We have working instruments like graspers, dissectors, needle holders, scissors, elevators, etc. And then you have others like the cannula, the clip applicator, the spirals, and there are many other small, small instruments. But then you should know, and now that's for the nursing team, uh, we'll have our nursing team take you through it. What is the basic setup? Because you, you, you may not have everything and you may not need everything. So what's a basic trolley setup? I think that's important for our nursing team. Just a quick overview look. This is how a xenon light would be. We currently have the LED light. In the past, they used to be tungsten lights or the filament. Then we went to the halogen, which is like xenon. And now we have LED. So LED is a bit of a cold light. Xenon is a warm or hot light. Uh, we have instruments. I mean, this is an insufflator that is used for gas insufflation. In our case, we use CO2 with a warmer. So this, this, this is a warmer. Uh, then we have, the, these are important points. Uh, this, I want you to remember, these are not negotiable. This is for safety of the patient. We have four measure settings in an insufflator. We have a preset max, the operative intra-abdominal pressure. So preset max should be operating between 10 and 15 millimeters of mercury. Uh, but you can increase it to higher when entry for your initial port. So put in the varies, which is a blind procedure. Increase it, go to up to 20. Uh, so that it helps you with putting in your initial troca. I go in direct troca entry. I don't use varies. Uh, then once you've done that, you have to bring it down to between 10 and 15 for operative purposes. Uh, if you're doing a pediatric, uh, let's say a, a pediatric, not very young, around 10, 12, 14 year old, you're operating at pressures around 10 to 12. If you're operating on younger kids around uh, let's say six, five, six, four, five, six, your pressures are about eight millimeters of mercury. And if you're operating on neonates or infants, then your operating pressure are just enough to create the cavity because the abdomen is very, very, uh, it's not very tight. The muscles are not developed. You get what I'm saying? So your pressure is not now the guide. You can't say I'm going to use 10 millimeters of mercury. It might be too much for that abdomen. So here it is just enough to get a good distension. You might be operating at even four or five millimeters of mercury. If you're operating in obese patients, bariatric, then your operating pressures are up to 18 millimeters of mercury. 
All right, so these are guidelines that you use in more immediately and maintains your abdomen, got it? So that is your max flow rate. You have suction pressures that is around 0.2 to 0.4 or 200 to 400 depending on the equipment you have. And the actual volume of the gas used should be monitored. I mean, it's also written on the side. So those are the four, four measures that we have in an insufflator. We call it therefore quadrumanometric, quadrimanometric of, uh, measures. So this is the en en endoflator or insufflator. We have operating instruments that we should know uh, about. We'll be seeing them and we'll probably be going through these uh, as a demo. But it is basically the sheath, uh, a handle uh, with a ratchet or without a ratchet, uh, with, which has rotatory capability and then it has the central working device. So this is uh, a general uh, instrument. These are types of ratchets or without a ratchet. We have different, uh, these are just for you to understand. We'll probably try and see if we can show you these instruments. But different uh, graspers, scissors. We have the hook scissors and then the medicine berm and the straight for the suture. We have different uh, types of uh, graspers. Those are dissectors. So these are graspers, the babcock. So we divide them mainly into uh, a, a, a traumatic, non-traumatic or atraumatic, and a semi-traumatic instrument. Uh, that's the basic differentiation, and then you have different one based on what they are specifically meant for. Uh, we move on further. These are suction and etc. So these are just examples. We have retractors, fan retractors for the liver sometimes that we would use, uh, a hook monopolar or a spatula. And then we have the varies and the clip applicators. Uh, so you must have discussed the varies needle. I'm not going into this. Remember, this is an overview. Uh, so what is the varies needle used for and how does it work? What are our trocars? I mean, the ports. So we have a trocar and a cannula together as a port. And we have divided them into either a reusable or a disposable. We divide them based on the diameter, a 12 millimeter, a 10 millimeter, a 7 millimeter, 5 millimeter, and 3 millimeter, for example, uh, of uh, different ports that we use for different type of scenarios. And in robotics, they go up to a 15 millimeter port. And then we have the, the cannula, the, the trocar that we have, the tip, Again, in these reusable ones, the tip is either a conical tip, a blunt tip, or a pyramidal tip. So you divide them or you classify them in this way, okay? Then you have the threaded ones, which are used so that you get less slipping. And then you have those that are non, the disposable ones, which are single use, and they are various types as well. So these are some disposable ones, for example. Then we have our scopes. So scopes are divided based in the, on the diameter and the angle. So you can either have a, a, a small hysteroscope, which is a 1.9, 2.94 millimeters, or a laparoscopy one, which is a five or a 10 millimeter. And then you divide them in the angle as a zero degree or a, an angled uh, 12 degree in resection or a 30 degree scope that we normally use in I normally work with a 30 degree scope in laparoscopy. Uh, we have the camera, so you should ideally know basic functions of the camera and the settings and the focus and the zoom and the ratchet on how to lock the scope. Now this is very important. Uh, each of us need to know this if we are to proceed with MIS training, I mean surgeries. Then we have different grasping forceps. Uh, and then all these different suction cannulas and the electrodes. We have the bipolar, different types. There's the Kleppinger, and then there's the reg regular Maryland and the flat fenestrated, etc. Needle holders, obviously, uh, one of the things that we are going to try and focus on in this training is on uh, the, the suturing, and we are going to have hands-on training on endo trainers about suturing, laparoscopic suturing. So for that, we need to know and work with the needle holders. 
uh, different grips, pistol grip like this one or a straight inline grip. So uh, depends on which type of positioning you have. Are you doing ipsilateral? Are you doing contralateral suturing? I now do ipsilateral suturing. Uh, I told you because of my shoulder. When I used to do this across the table, uh, this hand was to get a lot of straining. And I used to do a lot of suturing. I mean, because I, I, I do lots and lots of myomectomies, laparoscopic. So when you do very many myomectomies, it requires a lot of suturing, you know that. So when, you, when you're doing suturing very frequently, um, then you have to be careful with what positioning you maintain with the suturing. So now I am an ipsilateral surgeon, uh, but I used to be in the past, and that's very many years ago, over 15 years ago, I used to still do contralateral suturing. So maybe we'll, we'll teach you and we'll explain benefits of each. Why, why one over the other, or why, how do you decide which one to go for? We have elevators, different types. This is Clement Ferrand, and then so many other types. Uh, we have these ultrasonic uh, you know, shears. You must have gone through them. Then you have the, the advanced bipolar, like the, the NCL, the Ligasure. We have Thunderbeat, which is a combination of both. So you may need to at least know them because someday you may need to use them. We have a Mosellator. I know there's been issues about Mosellation uh, and it's been, it's been under caution. Uh, I wouldn't say banned. Uh, it's been under caution. Uh, it could be banned in the US. It's not banned here. Uh, I have done over 1,500 lap myomectomies. I've not come across one uh, sarcoma. It's not like I haven't had sarcoma, but I've been screening them well enough and I've operated on them once I suspect, I operate them on open. So it's, it's more of planning and when I know this is not, then I would use still a mosellator, but there is also the option of doing an in-bag mosellation inside a bag. So those are things we need to uh, probably go and go through. Cobbler needle for port closure. Now Quick summary on entry, uh, yes, so just brief on this and then I'll leave the other one later. So we should know what is safe entry, what are the frequency of injuries, uh, when is risk of injuries included, how do we increase, how do we avoid it and what to do when it actually occurs. So this has remained similar over the last 25 years and I would say all methods of entry are equal. Uh, so it's more of what you develop and what you specialize in. I am now, I told you, direct trocar entry. Uh, so I, I, I still have some of my mentees who are still comfortable with the various entry. Uh, I know our surgeons in, in this country are very comfortable with open Hassan's technique. So it's what you get used to. Uh, but, uh, but there's none that is superior over the other in terms of complications or risk factors. Uh, how to avoid injury? Obviously awareness and training as we are doing, optimal technique, whatever. So, so there is a technique process. You do not bypass any step there. Everything that needs to be done needs to be done in the right way. Uh, depends on experience over time. And then you have to be careful about these high risk ones like BMI being high, obese, uh, previous, or previous surgeries, etc. And then start using a technique that you're familiar with and comfortable for. We have the following types. We have the classic varies pneumoperitoneum trocar entry. Then we have the open technique, which is Hassan's. And we have the direct trocar entry, which I told you I use. And then we have the optical entry where you would go in with, let's say, the camera uh, attached to your trocar and go in together under vision. So these are some of the basic steps. This is what I say, just to lay down basic steps. In varies, number one, try and maintain silence because people in varies are going to feel clicks and they're going to try and listen for clicks. So don't have a very noisy theater. Check the spring mechanism, that's for the nurses. Check the spring before you hand it over. Uh, patient should always be flat. Do not try and enter when the patient is already in Trendelenburg. Your direction will take you towards the aorta in that position or in vena cava. So patient has to be flat. Initial entry, patient flat. These are rules ideally not to be broken. 
Uh, with experience, what you do is up to you, but for initial beginners, these are rules not to be broken. Give a good small incision, lift the abdomen away from the vessels. The angle depends on the BMI, so the angle changes slightly based on the BMI, but your angle is then eventually going to be towards the sacral hollow, but it will always be perpendicular to the skin. So when you're going, when you put it in, it will be going straight. Then when you start lifting this part, you will go this way, but it's still perpendicular to the skin. You don't enter this way to the skin. If you enter this way to the skin, you will be perforating it uh, across and your, 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 your tip of the varies might never reach the abdomen and then you'll be insufflating preperitoneal. And trust me, if you do that and the peritoneum peels off because of that, you're going to struggle now to go into that abdomen. It doesn't matter how good a surgeon you are. If it has peeled off, it's going to be like a curtain that'll be hanging. You'll always enter preperitoneum now. You, you understand what I'm saying? So be careful. And then you're going to be listening for two audible clicks in those tissues which are non-elastic. So there are two tissues in this layer that are non-elastic, which means you can't stretch them, okay? So they are the ones that will close the click. When you're going through fat, you'll not click, it will go slide. When you reach rectal sheath, it's not elastic. So when it, when it passes through, the spring action will come out and it will do tuck. Then you go further muscle, it will go through like that. When you reach the peritoneum, again, it's not stretchable, you will feel a tuck. So you hear for these two clicks and you know you should be in. What do you do after that? Start rotating around? No, please never do that. If you have gone into a vessel like this, it's like a needle, nothing will happen or bowel. But when you do that and now you do this, you're making that small hole into a laceration. And now you have a problem. So you do your safety tests of the saline and etc., but not moving around. So safety tests, very important. Uh, another advice, so these are summary of what is important. Secondary trochas, primary is going to be a blind entry. Secondary are always under vision and you always keep the inferior epigastric under view when you're putting in those. You don't want to hit that inferior epigastric. Always try and stay away from them. If you hit that by mistake, it has caused mortalities because it's a very high vessel, a high pressure vessel arising from the external iliac artery. Uh, you could try prior transilluminate to see the small superficial vessels. You can't transilluminate the inferior epigastric. It's under the muscle, but you can transilluminate those superficial vessels just to avoid them if can. And if it is anything that is bigger than 10 millimeters, always close it from the inside out. Don't close the skin and leave it, you'll herniate. Uh, entry at palmar's point, so you should know your, palm, your entry points, the, 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 the umbilical, intra, supra, infra, Li Huang's position, palmar's position, Jane's position. So these positions should be known to us. And this should all be done with the horizontal position of the patient, as I've said. Don't give a head low before your ports are in, okay? For the secondary, yes, you can give a head low and put so that the bowel has moved away before when you put the secondary ports. But primary port is always in a horizontal position. Uh, be careful, this one will be in those, uh, the, the, the difficult entry cases. The next one is electrosurgery tips and tricks. Uh, so very important. Uh, this is a monopolar circuit. Uh, so where you have the electrosurgical unit. Okay, so back to monopolar circuit. We have the electrosurgical unit out in through a small fine entry to the patient where you want the electrical energy converted to heat energy and you'll get a burn and then out through this broad return plate, uh, dispersive electrode that takes it back and returns to this. So if the circuit is complete, the machine will work. The newer machines is, if this thing peels off a little bit, 
it will break the circuit and the machine goes off. But in the past, it was not doing that. It was now looking for stray current exits. So you'd get an exit through an ECG electrode or through an earring or through, and you'd get burns. So this is, unless you know energy, <coughs> don't use it. This is one of the most dangerous equipment to play with in an abdomen if you don't know how to use it. So I think I, I take lots of classes on energy because this is very poorly understood and not covered in classes when we are doing post-graduation. And then the day you are out there, you are expected to start using it. So all people know is yes, blue and yellow, blue and yellow, blue to coag, yellow to cut. I tell them no, absolute nonsense. That is not how it's supposed to be worked with. All right? And when something doesn't work, you'll see the surgeon just say, increase it. It's not a, increase it. Increase it. I mean, my friend, that is danger work you're working on. So please, that's not how energy is to be used. Uh, we can have, uh, I think we may have some time, we'll do some energy demo as well. I'll show you exactly what needs to be done and how. How to return electrode rules. They should always be placed uh, across the patient, so it's like this. So I always tell people the return electrode should be closest to the surgical site. So you don't operate here and put it here. That's a bit far. Put it close to the patient, under the buttocks, in the thigh would be best. The reason is you don't want stray current to find way from here to here. It's pretty far, so it looks for the exits. Don't do that. Number two, remember I said fine in, it burns. So if you allow a fine out, it will burn. So if you put it this way, electricity is not, is not very generous on you and say, you know what, poor guy, he didn't understand how to put this electrode. Uh, let me be lenient with him. It's not gonna be lenient with you. You make a mistake like this and you give it this front tip, the electricity concentrates in the front tip. And then you finish the surgery and peel this off at the end of surgery, you'll see a burn here. And you start wondering, what happened? I mean, I did not do anything wrong. You know what you're gonna do? Call the manufacturer, your machine is defective. Can you come, it's burned my patient. Can you come and check it out? It was, it was the placement, you've understood. So simple things, simple things. Do not put it at an angle because you don't want a fine in and a fine out scenario. You've understood what I'm saying? Whenever it's fine in, it burns. So if you give them a fine out scenario, it will burn. Give it a broad out, okay? And it will never burn. Return electrode rules, always appropriate size, don't alter by making it, oh, it's not fitting, let's cut here and here and make it fit, no. Use the right size, don't change. Uh, if you have the, the black one or the, the metal one, then you, you may have to rot roll it round the patient and then tie around it, whatever. But what I meant was, you don't alter the sizes, okay? You maintain enough current. Also, if this, this one that you put around, you must have seen the metal one. I don't know if you have seen the old metal ones. Uh, people used to put wet saline or, or wet fluid and then roll it and put it in, or gel. Why? They're trying to increase the contact. So people say, oh, they don't want it wet, they don't want it. Nothing happens if it's wet, if it's saline because it has electrolytes. But if it's wet with, with betadine, or wet with water, or wet with spirit, it has no electrolytes. So then it will create a barrier. It will not burn, but it will create a barrier and therefore not enough contact, and therefore you'll have a problem. You understanding? So saline is not a problem. It's a friend in electrosurgery. It will disperse the electri electricity better, okay? So if you have to wet it, saline. Not, so don't let, like the sticky one, the, the blue ones that we have, the single use, the reason we don't want fluid on it is not because it will cause a short circuit. There's no short circuit here. But it will create a, a, a detachment and not, it will not allow it to stick well. You get what I'm saying? And because of that, it will not work well. Put it close, put it on muscular, put it on non-hairy. So if you have hair, ideally shave and then stick it, because otherwise it will stick to the hair and not to the skin. When it sticks to the hair and not to the skin, when you remove this, you'll have that burnt hair smell, because the hair would have, would have burnt. You've, you've understood, so it's still a burn, because 
the, the attachment should be to the skin, <coughs> not to the hair. Avoid bony prominences, avoid these hollow spaces like the popliteal fossa, avoid fat tissue, it has a lot of resistance. So put it on places that have good muscle. That's why the abdominal wall is not a good place to put it. It has fat, all right? But, but the gluteal region is good, it has muscle. The thigh is good, it has muscle. The calf is okay, it has muscle. So put it where there is good muscle, it has less resistance. Avoid tattoos, they have, multi, they have metal dyes, so they heat up as well. So we should know about cut, blend, and coag. The mode. Please don't equate cut, mode, or yellow for cut, and coag, mode, or blue for coagulation. Wrong. Okay? You use the cut mode because it's a lower voltage mode, and therefore it has probably, it is a safer mode. The quag mode is very, very, very dangerous if you don't know how to use it. So when you use even, when you use, even in open surgery, when you're cutting and then you hold uh, a vessel and you want to buzz it, you don't buzz it with the blue. You buzz it with the yellow. When you buzz it with the blue, sometimes you, you must have seen or heard or experienced it yourself where you, you suddenly will throw your instrument and it will have caused a burn here, you remove your glove and you'll see a small burn. And what is your answer going to be? This low quality Chinese gloves, all right? And the issue was not low quality Chinese glove. There was no hole in that glove. It found an exit through the glove, through you, out. You've understood what I'm saying? So it's because you used a very high voltage. The high voltage, this, this end is almost 6,000 volts and it's like a Lightning strike on and off. Lightning strike on and off. So you don't go there if you don't have to. You stick to these sides more, okay? So this is about energy. So cutting should be non-contact, continuous. And what do we need for cutting? Would be in a cut waveform, fine electrolyte, and an air gap. So when you want to cut well in myomectomy, you don't go touch the electrode and then activate because then you're desiccating. So if you want to cut, or let's not use the word cut, because we are mixing cut effect and cut uh, mode. So let's say you want to vaporize. So when you want to vaporize, you leave a small gap, activate it, the yellow, touch, and now slice like a knife. You'll see it will cut very nicely. Whereas when you do this and activate it, it will, it will stick. It will stick as you're going. You, you, you get the difference? So if you want to cut nicely, give a gap, activate, then slice, okay? Uh, so this is, this is what a cut would do, and this, you see, this is what a quag would do. It will cause a lot of lateral damage, lateral thermal damage. This is where I was saying, for this, for this system where you've held a vessel, don't use the blue. Don't use the blue, use the yellow. It is the best setting, it is safe, even for the patient, and safe for you. Bipolar, we all know about it, it is safe because it's only between these two. It's not coming out through the patient. But the tips again, lowest effective setting, don't go high. If, if, if they say you work with 30, but you're getting a good effect with 20 or 25, work with 20 or 25. You don't have to go for 30. Pulsatile, uh, don't, don't activate uh, by holding and don't activate it. Uh, hi, uh, when is tea going to be ready? It's still going on. Okay, all right, call me. When, when you remove it, you see a black there. So you're very happy, nicely cooked, well done. And then you cut and it still bleeds. You know why? Because you've burnt the outside and the inside is still uncooked. Not good. So you, you should work with a pulsatile fashion. So activate, release, activate, release. So this is constant and this is doing this. Or this is holding and this is on, off, on, off, on, off. So it's pulsatile, okay? So that way you will have the tissue turn white. Your target is white, not black charring. White blanching, not black charring. So when you get that and then you cut, it has cooked all the way in. I'm a vegetarian, but I'm told when people do steak, if you don't do it well, it will cook on the outside and inside will be raw. Am I right? But you want it well done all the way through. That's what we want in surgery. It is 
this vessel should be cooked all the way inside, not outside, and then you cut and it still bleeds. Make sense? So your target is white blanching, not black charring. Clean the instruments regularly. You open the bipolar before stepping off. Again, another important small point. These small points make a difference. When you've held it, you'll see bubbles forming around because the water or the blood, the fluid is, is bubbling. And then when you stop it, when you stop this, this instrument cools down. When it cools down, it will stick to that tissue. Are you getting what I'm saying? So the way to do it, hold, activate, release, release. Did you get my point? Why? Because when I release this first, there is still steam. So steam will not allow my tissue to stick to the instrument. You, when I release this first, this hot instrument will stick to the tissue because the steam dries up. You, you've got the point? So hold, activate, then don't release this. Release this, then release this. Got the point? So simple, small tips. You will not need to clean your instrument 20 times. That's the, that's the whole thing. Otherwise, every time it will stick with black things, you'll be giving your nurse clean, clean, clean. It becomes frustrating. <coughs> Activate only when touching tissue. Terminate at the end of vapor phase. Keep the volume of this equipment loud. So it should be audible probably above everything else in the theater. Why? Because don't say that's noisy, reduce the volume and you have your music. Fine, have your music, but that volume should still be loud so that when, when this instrument is lying on a patient somewhere or it's in there and the nurse or your assistant is just by mistake pressing it, you'll hear teet, you'll be like, who pressed what? Immediately, and then you look for where that electrode was. Because if you don't, then it will burn something. If it was lying on the patient, like it will burn here without you knowing. Okay, so it should be audible. It should be loud when you activate it. So by mistake, if you activate by mistake, someone hears it immediately. The cord should be free of kinks, knots, so don't try and have knots in the cord. Uh, operative, operator to confirm all settings himself or herself before activation. And the electrode should always be kept safely in a holster. Don't put the electrode on the patient's thigh or, or, or on top and then uh, you, you keep on working like that because when you activate by mistake, if it's a monopolar hook, it's actually burnt here without you knowing for sure. Trust me, that's very dangerous. <coughs> uh, did we discuss hysteroscopy? So I can quickly give you some tips on hysteroscopy. It's an endoluminal endoscope to visualize the uterine cavity and can be used to discuss a to do a variety of intrauterine procedures. It's from the word hystros and scopy to look into the uterus can be used for diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. The instruments are the following. We've discussed these. Then we have the resectoscope, uh, which is for more operative procedures using energy. Uh, in the past, we used to use monopolar resection with, uh, with uh, non-electrolytic solutions, which could be either hypotonic, hypertonic, or isotonic, but non-electrolytic, because monopolar cannot work in electrolytic solutions. And uh, nowadays, we use bipolar. So my question many times to, to the students is, if I'm doing uh, hysteroscopy, we use saline, am I right? So, a question, if I'm using saline and I use a monopolar resectoscope and I activate it by mistake inside the uterus of the patient, what will happen? Yes, doc. You know what I mean. You're using saline to do hysteroscopy, right? You have used a monopolar electrode, I mean monopolar resectoscope by mistake. You are not told this is bipolar you are given a monopolar resectoscope because those are the old ones that we always have been having and you activated a monopolar resectoscope in the patient while it is in the uterus. What happens? Any guesses? It's okay, yes. It will burn. That's the most common answer that people give. It's wrong. That's why I'm trying to explain. 
Okay, what did I just say about the electricity and, and electrolytes? It disperses it, right? So remember what I said, fine in, burn, brought out, no burn. Now here, you're in with an electrolyte, electrode, with a fine in on a tip where you're going to try and burn something on the uterus, but then all surrounding it is what? Is saline, which has lots and lots of electrolytes. So the moment you activate it, it disperses in that electricity. And it disperses along the whole surface of the uterus and the vagina and wherever the saline is touching. So it's broad out. You've understood. It will disperse into that broad saline curtain around it. So what will happen? Nothing will happen. It will never work. You've understood. So you'll, you'll, you, you can increase as much as you want. It will not be working. You'll think the machine is spoiled. But it's actually because you're using a monopolar in saline. You, you've now got the, got the idea? So it will not work. The thing is it will not burn. But that's the commonest answer I get. It burns the patient. Okay? <clears throat> so principles, remember, hysteroscopy is done in a very narrow cavity uh, and a very small cavity. So you don't, and it's a one-man show. One-man show means you're the only surgeon, you're the only assistant, you're the, you're, you, do, you don't have two people holding things for you. And it's a one-handed surgery. So uh, what I mean is normally, you know, we do surgery, traction, counter-traction, cut, pull, stretch, cut. That's what we do, right? In hysteroscopy, it's like one is just holding the view, but one is cutting, tuck, tuck, cut. You, you get what I'm saying? So it's, it's a bit tricky. Hysteroscopy is more difficult than laparoscopy, by the way. And it's also more dangerous because the, the error margin is very tiny. You can easily complicate very quickly, okay? So uh, the pressure should be kept lowest to distend the cavity, ideally around the mean arterial pressures. Uh, then you can use normal saline with the bipolar energy. Uh, we have risks of perforation, etc. But if you perforate without energy, don't bother. If you perforate with something to do with energy, like a resectoscope, then make sure you do a, lap a hysteroscopy, I mean a laparoscopy to assure you did not burn some bowel outside there. Uh, precautions to avoid complications. Try and thin up the endometrium before. Get a good continuous control of fluid balance. Uh, the pressure should be maintained to a minimum, etc. So what is the issues to be learned in hysteroscopy? Remember, it's a one-man show. The most challenging part is the entry. If you do your entry properly, the rest is okay. This is where people get stuck. You need to know technology around hysteroscopy. Uh, ideally speaking, this should be taught vaginoscopic. Uh, I only do vaginoscopic. I never hold, dilate, and go in with a hysteroscope. We go in direct with the vaginoscopic entry. You need to know fluid, its distension mechanisms, and its issues of overload. You need to know it's going to be working with a very small cavity with lots of possible pathology, uh, and only one instrument is operating at any given time. So this is issues you need to learn about hysteroscopy. It's not, I just need to know how to do hysteroscopy. And do what? If you don't know that this is what's going to be required, do what? Remember, they are fragile instruments. These are so tiny that people, the scopes are tiny, they are thin, 2.9. The instruments are five French, 1.6 millimeters. It's, I, I, I've had a workshop where I, I had a couple of, of, of you know, delegates and in less than 10 minutes, uh, three scissors were broken, okay, in, in, in training. And the simple thing was because of how they were handled. So you see, when you, when you have, when you're going in this way, and then you're trying to hold the scissors that way, you're bending it, it breaks immediately. So in 10 minutes, in 10 minutes, I kid you not, that table broke one, that table broke one, and I'm like, now what, 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 what are we to do? So be careful, they're fragile instruments. It's easy, very easy to get an obscured vision because something can come in there. You have risks of, of uh, leakage, etc., And the risks, I told you, can be very dangerous. <clears throat> The guidelines, basic guidelines on hysteroscopy. Number one, remember you're going to be working with constant pressure variable flow system. So what does that mean? When you use saline in a, in a, in a bag and have gravity, 
It can work for diagnostic procedures, people do it. But remember, that is constant, constant flow and constant pressure. You've understood. So it means uh, you're not going to be able to get a distension the same way you want at all times. The next one you have is when you put that and then you put a pressure bag around it and you, you're pressurizing it. So you're going to get a constant flow but variable uh, distension. Okay? So every time you suction out or it leaks out, the cavity collapses, it goes up, and you don't want that. What you want is constant pressure but variable flow hysteroscopy system. What does that mean? When the f f pressure inside the uterus is low, okay, the flow increases to make it more. When the pressure inside is already good, the flow reduces to make it remain that way. You've understood. So you, you, what you want is a constant pressure with a constant view of the uterine cavity at all time, but the flow is variable. The only thing that can give you that is that pump, hysteroscopy pump, they are histromat, endomat, call it whatever you want. But that pump maintains constant pressure, variable flow system. Then you're going to be using a three-channel diag three diagnostic operative hysteroscope most times. The patient always, hysteroscopy, don't do hysteroscopy. Don't do hysteroscopy in a tender look back position. I warn you, don't do hysteroscopy. If you ever do that and you have a problem like an air or gas embolism, you will kill the patient. So don't do it in a trendling position, flat. Then work around ma the maximum preset pressures around the maps or maximum 100 millimeters. Don't go very high. Don't, don't put very high and get a nice stretch on the balloon of the uterus. Uh, I, I don't believe it's necessary and I feel it can be dangerous at times. Work with flow rates of around 200 to 400 milliliters per minute. And these are your deficit limits. You should know this by heart if you are to operate hysteroscopically. You don't go with a deficit, not volume used. Deficit. Deficit is in minus out. You could use in of 8 liters, but if you can account for 7 liters, your deficit is 1 liter. You've understood? So your deficit should not cross this in normal saline and should not cross this in hypotonic solutions. This changes in a renal compromised patient or some people with cardiac issues. But this is in a normal young woman, okay? <coughs> ergonomics. Uh, we have a talk on ergonomics. Yeah, so I'll not touch ergonomics. We'll discuss, uh, I keep quickly go through it. All right, so I'll, I'll go through the principles of ergonomics, very important. Uh, ergonomics is, as I've said, how to suit your work to yourself for safety. Uh, we, for so many years, have always been thinking of patient as our main priority. Good, but we need to take care of ourselves as well. That comes in ergonomics, how to do your work well so that you don't injure yourself. These are the principles we need to know. Number one, inline visualization of the target, inline, okay? Number two, triangulation of instruments. Number three, we'll talk about patient position, conflict of instruments to be minimized, table height, tactile limitation, port positioning, ergonomics of instruments, ergonomics of principles of port placement. We need to know fulcrum effect. We've discussed this. Remember, it's opposite movement. And try and maintain a one into one ratio if you can. So don't go too close to the pathology. Then you have too much of an instrument out and a very little in. So you'll have to move so much for a little to move inside. Don't stay too far from the pathology where you have your port here and the tissue is there. You'll move this way and that instrument moves so much there. You, you, you get it? So try and maintain a one is to one ratio so your positioning of the port could actually change based on the size of the pathology. Okay? If the uterus is up to the umbilicus or just below the umbilicus, you can't put a port in the umbilicus now. You'll be sitting and watching the uterus like this. And I mean, you'll be wondering, how am I supposed to navigate this? Okay, so what do you do? 
You move your scope away, go higher, and then you'll see the pathology there. It automatically looks less threatening to you. All right, you'll be like, ah, it's okay, that uterus I can handle. So don't work with the uterus this way. Work, you, you, you've understood what I'm saying? Keep it far. So change your positioning based on that there's no standard positioning. You have guidelines, but based on pathology, you might change, okay? Next thing, don't put two ports close to each other, too close to each other. You'll get the, the chopstick effect. I, I still don't know how to use chopsticks. We were, we were at a Japanese restaurant yesterday. I can't use chopsticks to save my life, all right? Because they, 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 they don't seem to hold the food with me. I need my spoon or my fork. But, but uh, in surgery, when you take them too close to each other, your instruments or, your, or the scope and the instrument will be fighting, okay? So you, you'll find it difficult and then you'll be like, ah, oh, this is, it's, it's difficult to do surgery laparoscopically. It's not difficult, you make it difficult by not following these rules. So follow the rules, you'll be fine. Minimum eight to 10 centimeters apart from each other, always. Mirror image, don't ever work against a camera. So if I'm seeing this way, I'm working this way, that's working along the camera. You've understood? If I'm seeing this way, and I come with a port with an instrument this way, it doesn't matter how good a surgeon I may be, I'll have a challenge trying to grasp because I'm moving against the, the, the mirror. So you'll have a problem when moving against the camera. Port placement uh, ergonomics, so we've just discussed how do you decide based on pathology size and et cetera, et cetera, but following the guidelines. So what is the effect of not being ergonomic? If you don't follow those, some of those ergonomic principles, the angles, there's so many things in ergonomics we would discuss. The angles, what is manipulation angle, uh, inclination angle, what is azimuth angle, how do you work around it, what's the guideline to the the height of the table, what's the guideline to the distance from the, from the screen, what's the height of that screen supposed to be. So you don't operate with a screen that is up there and you're doing surgery like this. I, you, you can't do that. If you do that, you'll only operate five cases and you'll have a cervical issue. So God help you after that, all right? So what I'm trying to tell you is you have to plan it in such a way that this height of the screen is is modifiable so don't have a fixed height if you can have them on boom arms it's better you can adjust the position so that based on the height of the surgeon and the anesthetist you move the screen up or down you've understood so that is important if you're not ergonomic what will happen the surgeon will get fatigue he'll get stressed he'll start shouting he'll start throwing instruments maybe get some injury as well himself but what will happen for the patient? The poor patient will get poor outcome, all right? Because you are stressed while working, you're tired, you're getting fatigued. So don't work like that. There are issues also with instruments. Ideally speaking, I would want to know how many of you use a size seven glove? Seven and a half? Six and a half? So why are we using different size gloves? Why? Because it fits better, am I right? When you use the wrong size, does it not make it feel funny? How many of you have years done laparoscopy with different sized instruments? Are they not all the same? They're standard, am I right? They're all 36 centimeters, and they're all this way, the same handle. Even, let's say, forget that, even when you talk of a normal scissors or an open surgery, let's put it that way. Are you being given different sizes because you're a size six and a half and he's a size eight? So you see what I'm trying to tell you? Why? Why are we assuming my hands will fit the scissors the same way as your hands will fit the scissors? You've understood? Now that's a problem, but it's a problem that is going to be difficult. I foresee future where the manufacturers will probably come and say, sir, you know the way they make your suit for you? They'll come and say, sir, can I take your measurement of your hands? I want to make you customized instruments that will fit your hand. Wouldn't that be the best? So when you go into theater, you're told, okay, remove Yamal Patel set of laparoscopy. But jokes aside, guys, ideally that should be happening. 
What I meant was why not have customized size based on how your fingers and hand size is. You, you get what I'm saying? So this is a problem. This leads us to more injuries because we are using the same size whether it's small or big for us. Then issues with instruments. The instruments are long instruments. They are passed through narrow parts and then they are in fixed positions because of fulcrum. So you have to remember when you are trying to <coughs> trying to grip something here, in an, in an open surgery, the, the, the fulcrum is in the middle, like in a scissors or an artery forceps, agreed? So it's a one to one ratio. You put one pressure here, you get one pressure here. You put, you, you, you understanding what I'm saying? In laparoscopy, you'll have to put three pressure here to get one pressure here. You'll have to put more pressure here to get the same pressure on this. You, you understanding? So you'll, you'll, it's not the best scenario. So you have to therefore uh, be careful with how much pressure you put so that you don't injure your hands. <coughs> <coughs> then hand and shoulder fatigue, the way I told you, because of our ergonomics. So we have to remember that's a problem. So how do you solve these problems? Number one, exercise. Number two, nutrition. Number three, relaxation. Number four, good positioning. We'll discuss that. So those of you who, who see our athletes, our footballers, right? Can you tell me one footballer who will get into the field and start running and start playing? You'll all see them come, stretch. Am I right? Yes or no? How many surgeons do that? We think we are God. We don't need stretching, we are, we are good, man. You understood? Wrong. That's a problem. It's a mental issue we have. Ideally speaking, we should do warm-ups before going into theater, all right? If you want to survive long, I mean it. And when you're doing a long surgery, every half an hour to an hour, you step away from the table, you stretch a bit, you've understood? Without contaminating yourself, and then go back. But that's what we need to do. You're not supposed to go in and start operating on a six, eight hour surgery and you have not stretched yourself, you're not exercising, you're not hydrating, you're not eating. Bad news for us. That's how you, you injure yourself. So warm up and stretches before activities that are repetitive, static or prolonged. Breaks and stretches every 20, 30 minutes. Respect failful positions. If you're doing something, if you're doing a vaginal surgery, think about it. The surgeon is sitting on the stool at the level of the, the, the vagina and is operating, right? The assistant here is doing that, all right? When, when he's tired, he does this, hey! Okay, sorry, sir. So are you getting my point? Why? Why are you not understanding that it's impossible to stand in that position for that long? Respect that person's position, say, okay, fine, take a break, come back, one minute, just stretch and come. You, you get what I'm saying? That, that painful position, respect it. If you don't, it's going to cause injury to you over time. That is about ergonomics, okay? So respect painful position and stop painful activity. Recognize early signs of inflammation. So when you know this is constantly hurting even after surgery, something is wrong. See somebody to take, take an immediate action. If you need physiotherapy, have it assessed. Do something, but you're going to otherwise cause more injuries over time. An ideal relaxed position, what is it? So number one, the table goes down to the waist level. So 0 0.49 to the height of the surgeon. So don't start measuring and then say, okay, 0 0.49. Uh, bring it at 98 centimeters. It's not that way, but what I meant was roughly the level of the waist or slightly below would be your table height. So what happens when I'm the surgeon and Joy, who is a very tall person there, hi Joy, yes, is my assistant. So if, if Joy, who is shorter than me, is my assistant, and I put it at my level, for her it might be high, so she'll be doing this. So what does she have to do? Maybe put a stepping stool, stand up, and come this way, and then operate. You, you, you get it. So have a stepping stool in theater that someone can use if they have to. Don't be insensitive to different heights of people, all right? So 
you have to adjust. Someone is on a stepping stool, someone is on the ground, but you, you, rule, you follow the rule of waistline table. Then gaze down view. Your, mirror, your monitor should be around 15 degrees down. Not this way. 15 degrees gaze down is relaxed. So I'm, 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 I'm relaxed, 15 degrees gaze down. The monitor distance should not be this close, right? The monitor distance should be a certain distance. When you go to a movie theater, those of us who may have noticed, what will you see? A certain level of theater movie ticket size seats disappear first. Not the balcony. The balcony is just expensive for people who want to spend money and sit behind there. That's fine. But the seats that will disappear first is FGH. FGH lines will disappear very fast. You know why? That's the line where the screen is fitting your angle of view and you're seeing everything so nicely. When you're here, you're seeing this big. So if you want to see something here, you'll have to do this and do this and do this. You, you've understood? So when you're close, it's a problem. When you're too far, the screen is that much. You're seeing this person moving that phone of his and, 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 and eating popcorn. And you, you've understood? So your view is capturing things that you don't want to see. You want to see the movie. So FGH disappears. So you have to think why. Why every time I come to book a movie theater, FGH is gone? You, you, you get it? That is because of that. It's, it's, it's soothing to your eye, and it's, in, it's fitting your screen. It's not, it's not too close. It's not too far. Next thing, straight line. Me, pathology, view, straight line. So not me, pathology, screen. So don't operate this way. Me, pathology, view. That's how you position your scope, I mean your, your monitor. Triangulation, straight head. So straight head means this is, this is how it should be, not this way, not this way, not this way, not this way. Got it? Straight head, positioning. Shoulders in a relaxed position, so not this way. Don't do winging. This will hurt you after some time. So your relaxed position, the angle between the arm and the is around 15 degrees. The angle between this straight and this is around 15 degrees. This is semi-pronated, okay? Not supinated, don't operate like this. You're operating like this, holding your instruments lightly like this. So <coughs> this, is, this is an ideal, ideal positioning. Whether you use in-grip or over-grip, it's up to you. Over-grip is good for long, prolonged position. So if someone is doing retraction, over-grip. But the, otherwise you can do an in-grip, okay? So you, you have to make sure that is all followed in those rules. If you use that kind of an ergonomic ideal stance, I would say you can operate for hours and hours without getting tired. You can suture for hours and hours without getting tired. Otherwise, one case is enough to make you tired. Positioning. You must have discussed positioning, and, and uh, I think I'm, this is probably among the last few uh, topics, but this is what we have covered in basics, I believe. So positioning is very critical for patient. You don't want injuries, and many of them, if positioned badly, will cause nerve injuries, etc. So what is an ideal position? It's the position that is ideal surgical positioning, balancing good access with minimal risk. So you don't want to injure the patient, but you want to make sure you see better when operating. Different positions are used for different surgeries. The positioning should only be done after an anesthetist is informed and is ready and is moving. The positioning is done at least with one, two, three assistants. You don't do one person and pull it. The positioning is not done by just pulling the sheet and doing that. You'll cause friction burns when you sometimes slide off the sheet from under the patient. So you have to lift and move, not stretch and move. Okay, that's how positioning is done. Um, so you should know the correct position. Now, what are the common positions we use in gynae? We have a dorsal supine position. We have a lithotomy position. We have a semi-lithotomy position, which is the Lloyd Davis position. And then we have a Trendelenburg position where we have a head down position that we would use. To prevent 
energy, I mean to prevent injuries, these are important points, just points. Number one, uh, prevent sliding by using materials that do not allow slipping. So when you're doing head low, have some shoulder support, uh, maybe have a strapping, have a non-slip <coughs> mat so that the patient is not sliding off the table. Uh, so that is important. Leg positioning in syrups have a padding around the perineo, peroneal nerve, but with the new the Allen stirrups, etc., you may not need to have padding because they're already padded. But if you have those old types, or candy cane or those other knee, knee stirrups, make sure you support this area. These areas, if you have a problem and you press this for too long, when they wake up, they'll, they'll have a foot drop, okay? And, and you'll not understand why they've had a foot drop when I've done nothing in the leg, but it's your positioning. Minimize high lithotomy, so don't take the legs beyond, don't, don't take it beyond, backwards, beyond where they are, they, are, they are flexed. So that is a wrong positioning, okay? Femoral nerve, do not acutely flex at the groin, so don't acutely flex, you will injure the femoral nerve. Shoulder should never be hyperextended, so don't, don't do this. Right, because let's say you're putting them straight. We do that in open surgery. But whether you're putting them straight, but then you need to go this way to operate in the pelvis. So you know what you're going to tell the anesthetist? This hand is obstructing me, right? So what do you do? The patient's hand is like this. You tell them, do this. This is bad. This is very bad for the patient. You don't lift it above the, the level of 90 degrees. Don't do that. So they are supposed to position them on the side of the patient with an extended extension cable, extension lining that you can then have on the side so that, and they're tucked in, you've understood? Or if you want, then this, this might be okay, but you can't do this. You can't go above that angle. You'll injure this, this place. Uh, then Allen stirrups and avoid a very steep Trendelenburg, especially if you don't have anti-slip mechanisms in place. In conclusion, the positioning and padding are necessary to prevent injuries. The highest risk group for nerve injuries depend on the, those with body mass that is high and those having those long procedures. Uh, use proper appropriate body positioning systems as well. Pre-op checklist. So, we should all work with, we covered checklist in basics. Uh, if we haven't, then we should. Uh, this is just to make sure that we are reminded on what to do because human error can be costly and when errors can cost us life. We, we know this. So we're not allowed to have errors in our procedures. When a patient dies in a medical condition, the question that is asked is what happened? A renal case, a cardiac case, a liver case, that's what they'll ask, right? When something happens or a patient dies in a surgical case, trust me, the question is not going to be what happened. The question is, what did you do? Are you seeing the difference? Because ideally that patient should have been otherwise healthy. So many times the question you'll be asked is, what did you do? And it's not an easy question to answer, okay? so. We have to learn from the aviation industry. This industry decided to look beyond pilot error and individual failure. Everything was not the pilot made a mistake, the pilot made a mistake, the pilot made a mistake. Uh, they had the black box, which by the way apparently is orange in color, not black in color. They had the black box that was recording everything and then they were supposed to mandatory report any mishap within 24 hours. Where are we compelled to report our complications? We're not, all right? So you try and keep quiet, hush, hush, manage it, and keep quiet. But this was done, and then they are taught to acknowledge their own limitations and say yes. So the, 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 the way they were, then they do the analysis of that mishap, they're not trying to find fault with this pilot, but they're trying to find out what happened and how can we improve to make it better. With us, it's different. All right? It's always, what did you do? Okay? So zero error state is impossible to achieve, and it's important not to blame patients for what went wrong, but to understand why what they did at that time made sense to them. This was said by Sidney Decker. So very important, it's impossible to avoid human error, but then minimize human error is important. 
How do you minimize human error? You have a reporting system that is anonymous. You have to teach people about human factors, situational awareness, make people speak up, uh, create red flags so that when there's something, bring up a red flag, have SOPs in theaters, etc. have briefing and debriefing before and after a complex procedure, have script scripted handoffs, but then have the safety checklist. So we are discussing safety checklist. This would be a surgical count, you know, blackboard to make sure you're not getting complications, uh, you're keeping your counts properly. So this is something many people use, the WHO safety checklist, where you have the sign in, sign out, time out, et cetera. So it's important to follow that. And then there is a laparoscopy surgery safe checklist. I think this is where I'm focusing on uh, to make people understand and I told you, work as a team. Have a safety checklist that is developed in your theater. And it could be something like this. Is there a surgical su surgeon preference card? Did I check what he needed? Yes, yes, tuck, 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 done. Is the OR position correct, table correct? Yes, it is flat, the height is okay, the, the accessories, the supports are there, the, the, the prevent anti sleep is, you get what I'm saying? You've done everything. Then you check, is everything connected to power? Yes. Is my CO2 okay? Yes. Are the settings correct? Yes. Is it connected? Is there a backup cylinder? Yes. So that's a checklist. So that you don't get unnecessary complications and delays. Is my vo video monitor in position? Is it too high? Is it too low? Is it distance according? So put it there. Okay? Uh, is the test pattern checked? Is it like when I'm ready to start is when you turn it on and then like you're waiting for five minutes for this machine to turn on and you're like trying to now find out what happened. Why is this machine not turning on? That's wrong. That's a waste of time. Your checklist should tell you, do it. I see people smiling. I know these things must be happening. All right. But you see what I mean? It should be checklist. Then suction irrigation, not when I need it and there's a bleeder there. I'm like, suction. Okay, 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 I'm connecting, connecting. I mean, connect it, keep it ready, test it. What's the problem? You know you're going to use it, then connect it. So that is what I meant by checklist, okay? So this is, is the alarm on and audible? I told you when you're pressing something, is it loud? So, so that someone is alerted when something is pressed by mistake. Is my documentation, my flash drive in there, is it ready to record? What about my scrub, scrub person? My scrub person's checklist could be the following. Did I check? Did I connect my instrument? Did I see it's open? Is my ins insulation correct? Is it, is it opening and closing? Is it not at the last minute when I ask for it? So is the various needle spring okay? Is it patent? Is it valve is opening? So you're checking all this before you start. Okay, that's called a checklist. After the patient is already put in, the first one. Is the patient secured to the patient? So this is your team doing it while you're operating so that you're not going to be making noise every now and again. Why is this not done? Why is that not done? Because they are not aware. So that situational awareness of when. Is my return plate correctly placed? Is it, remember I said, not at an angle, straight, widest across? Is it connected? Is that showing a green, not a red, that there is disconnection? All that should be checked and set. Is my bipolar connected? Is it tested? Fill it on a gauze and test it and listen. Is the monopolar working? Not when I start, then you start setting it up. Okay? So this is prep and rep. So please understand, most currently, most surgical teams do most of the right things on most patients most of the time. What should be the ideal? This checklist makes us do all the right things on all the patients all of the time. You see the difference? Not most, all, okay? Then we, will, we, we have gone through dry lab exercises. I believe you must have done some of these. We will try and put up some of these exercises. Access, depth, eye hand, hand hand, precision, camera skills, etc. So with this, welcome to the ISG Advanced Intensive Course.